So it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, uh, Professor Mukund Tate of NCBS. Uh, Mukund has been a frequent visitor uh, until the pandemic, and I think it's really his first visit after that, but um, hopefully he'll be a frequent visitor again. Uh, he's uh, basically a physicist by training and calls himself an accidental biologist. Uh, Mukund joined NCBS uh, in 2004, August, which is the same month I joined here, and I've known him almost since that time. And uh, the one thing notable about him is the way he communicates his excitement at all the you know new research topics that he follows, and there seems to be a new one almost every time I meet him. So I remember he's talking about uh, uh, how glycans are assembled, then how the Golgi works, and so on. But a lot of his recent work, well, actually, it turns out since 2010 or so, is about how um, this complex organization of the cell evolves, uh, has evolved. Um, it's a hot topic of research internationally, but his contribution as a sort of physicist who thinks about simple models of how uh, other things can be explained uh, has won him the Infosys Prize this year. And it's, I believe, not what he's talking about today, so we'll invite him again to talk about that. But uh, over to you. So thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, invited to speak uh, at this very special occasion. Um, so as, uh, as Rahul said, so when I was uh, asked to give a talk here, I was thinking about whether to give a research talk, but since this session was a, a different type of session about higher level uh, topics, I picked a topic that I, I thought maybe uh, Aladi Ramakrishnan would have uh, liked, which is uh, engagements between art and science, because you know he was a great science communicator, he was passionate about it. Uh, he was also a patron of the arts and a, a connoisseur of Carnatic music, uh, so, you know, so that's my excuse for being able to talk on this theme. So I'm going to be talking about collisions between uh, art and science. It's sort of a personal journey um, with some general messages. So uh, this, this picture is actually from um, a children's book. Uh, it's called Sushila's Columns. But um, the study of these patterns that uh, sort of generative models that make these columns were uh, actually a, a topic of a research study right, right here in, in Madras. Um, and it turns out that uh, the generative rules to make these uh, um, these objects um, actually also lead to uh, certain types of directed graphs which show up in my research, uh, which are exactly the, uh, the transport graphs that satisfy the molecular constraints to move things around in a cell. Um, and I, I found this to be a, a, a very nice uh, a, a, you know, outcome. It's not something I would ever read about except that I came across this work by, by chance. So this is just to say that um, you know, as um, mathematicians especially and, and scientists more generally, tend to uh, develop an aesthetic sensibility that, uh, that guides their work. You know, some, uh, you know you're going in the right direction because it, it looks beautiful or it, 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 uh, you can see that things are coming together in some abstract sense, right? This often, in fact, translates to um, uh, a keen interest in, in things like the performing arts or the visual arts. But uh, that link between art and science is actually much more general. It's not just about the appreciation, right? It goes far beyond aesthetics. So what I want to ask in, uh, in today's session is, you know, when artists and scientists uh, interact, what should each side hope to get out of such an engagement? Do they need to do it? Is there anything productive that can happen that comes out of it? Productive, not just fulfilling for themselves, but also productive in a more uh, socially useful uh, sense, right? Because these are open questions. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, put a caveat here. So these are all, uh, as I said, uh, garnered from my own experience trying to work in this uh, interface, but it's certainly not meant to be comprehensive. We are certainly not pioneers in doing this kind of work, and so there's a huge number of people engaged in this enterprise throughout the world. This is just to give you a snapshot about pieces of this which I've seen, um, just to hope to get especially the young people here stimulated to maybe cross over that barrier. Okay, so if you want to um, think about this engagement between artists and scientists, you really have to start by situating yourself in each side and seeing how much each is contributing to the equation. And when you do that, there's a wide spectrum of ways in which uh, these two communities can, can engage, okay? And it goes all the way from, uh, so let's see, endorsement, introspection, designing, and challenging. Up here is where it's really the scientists who are in the driver's seat. Um, and uh, down here is really the artists, um, and it's almost an adversarial relationship. So let me just go through each of these in, in turn. All right, so endorsement. So this is where the artist is not coming um, to, to question the task that is uh, given to them by scientists. In fact, they're almost there just for their technical skills. And they do a lot of work that helps to improve the efficiency, the impact, uh, and so on of uh, things like science outreach and science popularization. 
Okay, so so artists do have a role over here. Um, for example, the production of good visuals and uh, and videos and so on really do help um, in conveying complex scientific ideas to the general public, to children, and and so on. Um, so this is uh, outreach, and this is something which a lot of our institutions do. Certainly, Math Science has been doing it. Uh, Science at the Sabha is uh, is now part of the cultural um, uh, calendar of the city. And um, this is where I think scientists determine what subjects to talk about and the artists determine how best to convey the information. There's also a more balanced, uh, let's say, engagement between artists and scientists. Um, I've just picked two categories like that. So one is introspection, where um, an artist of some type uh, enters a scientific environment and says, um, why exactly are you carrying out the work you're doing? Uh, can you extract meaning, um, maybe see connections to society or understand wider implications of the work you're doing? So these are the kinds of things where the artist in some sense represents society and the scientist represents the new research and the two haven't quite met and you're trying to bridge that gap, right? So that's one is introspection, so exploration, insight, what exactly does the work mean? You could also think of it as designing, so engineers are a type of artist, right? Um, certainly there are artists who are very, very good engineers and they can actually take the product of science and they can go out and invent things and, and uh, you know, in a very speculative way also, not necessarily for a commercial, commercial use, right? But these are all places where the artists and the scientists are collaborators. Each has to learn the other's language and then try and do something new with it. And then there's this last one, which is I think sort of less appreciated. It's less done, but it does happen. So this is where the artist challenges the scientist. It can be critique, it may well be subversion. You, know, you take the tools of science and you do something nobody ever expected you to do, um, just to see what, what, what happens, right? Um, so it, these activities, they, to carry out each of them requires a different context. Of course, the top one, um, an artist working on an outreach program, is very easy to imagine how it works in an institutional context, right? You run a communications office, you hire people, they generate works. These two, really require a space um, where there is trust in the activity, there's time to learn each other's languages, and through this building of mutual trust, you actually, um, as partners, uh, generate output, okay? Now, the last one um, is where I think, interestingly, uh, especially in the, the area I'm talking about today, which is bio-art, um, it has, uh, it has, uh, roots in, uh, in sort of DIY biology and so on that started in the US with the synthetic biology movement. But surprisingly, India is uh, sort of a place where bioartists around the world recognize as a place where interesting work can happen. And that's because uh, although our institutional structures don't tend to support this kind of activity where you bring in an artist and don't tell them what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do, at an institutional level, there are a lot of individuals who are happy to do this kind of thing. And there are institutions that are willing to entertain this kind of effort as long as it doesn't go too much into the sort of subversive uh, end, end of that zone, okay? So I'm going to give you examples of each of these things that, uh, you know, I've had the, uh, the luck to, to work in. Um, so I took that, uh, that spectrum actually from this uh, thesis of uh, Alexander Daisy Ginsburg, who's a, who's a bio artist. And um, she, you know, again, she's got this axis of endorsing uh, versus challenging. And then when an artist comes in, what do they use as a material? You know, many artists, for example, science fiction writers, you know, they just speculate. They see, they may not fully understand the techniques and they, and they sort of imagine what the scientists are doing and either they critique or they endorse, but uh, it's absolutely speculative. But what's happened over the last 20 years or so is that there are artists who are trained as absolute biologists. They can do molecular biology, they can actually go do cloning, they can build tissues and so on. So these artists are actually using biology as a substrate, as a material. And then they're using that substrate to either endorse in terms of design, you know, in fact, the first uh, um, uh, synthetic meat was, uh, was made by a bio artist, not, not by these new companies, right? Um, but uh, they, can also, they can also critique. And in fact, that project over there in this uh, spectrum is the project that uh, um, I had uh, some role in working on with the Sushti Institute. I'll talk about that in just a second. So, uh, so let's, let's talk about all these, all these different pieces. So I, I actually got started with this, uh, uh, this area of synthetic biology in my, during my PhD. This is when that whole movement, it was even named synthetic biology. Uh, the idea of like reprogramming cells and changing how their genetic networks are, first with bacteria and then they became more ambitious. And the, the sort of clarion call for synthetic biology was this um, paper in Nature, which was accompanied by an artist generated cartoon. Because these days you would use uh, generative AI to make these. But anyway, so these cartoons, which, which 
you know, it depicted the idea of going out and manipulating cells as a, you know, fun activity. It was the, 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 the ethical implications were not considered. It was, it was just, you know, just go out and like modify the world and just see what happens later. Um, this was the, um, the flavor of it, right? Very much uh, an endorsement of the science, an acritical look at the science, enabling the science in some way by enthusing young, young people to work in it. One um, uh, wing of that was this thing called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which is like a robotics competition, but you make real cells. Um, and this started running in uh, 2004, 2005. But the first international competition started in 2006. And in fact, um, we had the only Indian team going to IGEM in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And for the first three years, our team at iGEM was very much in this endorsing science uh, part of the spectrum. We, we, we very much bought into this idea that you could manipulate cells and do useful things with them. And, you know, we were thinking about things as engineers. Um, around, around that time, in fact, uh, so NCBS um, had uh, the opening to do some engagements and public engagements. And we were thinking what the best way is to do it. And we were lucky to... Um, have to, uh, been um, contacted by a group of people who are funded by the Wellcome Trust um, to do a public engagement project in different parts of the world. And these were theater practitioners, playwrights, uh, directors, dramaturgs, actors. Um, and what they wanted to do was to take a complex biomedical topic and to see what the implications of that were to society at large and to be able to communicate that through the medium of theater, which obviously is very well suited um, for for dissecting complex ideas, right? Because you can have many layers of meaning uh, in a performance. And so the way this worked is that they were actually funded. So this was a group of people from the UK as well as theater practitioners from Bangalore in India. Uh, and they came to NCBS and they were there for two straight weeks. And they talked to people, they entered labs, they saw how uh, what work was going on. And through all this, um, we had to come up with scientific themes. And these themes over the course of three, three successive years of this engagement, became plays that were actually written, then performed in different parts of the world. One of the plays was actually performed in, in other countries. Um, and uh, what I really enjoyed about this process, and uh, there were many of us at NCBS who engaged with this, um, was that they came with questions um, which we had not thought to ask, either because it didn't occur to us or because we were too busy just doing the work that was right in front of us, but very much questions that resonated with members of the public when these plays were otherwise performed. So they were actually people who were able to distill questions as lay people, but ask it in such an efficient way because they are theater performers and writers and able to extract what was crucial to each of these topics from us. Uh, the play where I was actually listed as a scientific advisor is called The Invisible River. It's set in the Ganga. Um, and it asks the question about uh, why the waters are considered holy. And one of the characters uh, is a scientist who says, oh, these are holy waters simply because they contain viruses that kill cholera bacteria. And then there's, a, there's another character who says, well, you know, but, but uh, really the, the whole idea of uh, holiness cannot be reduced to uh, some sort of scientific explanation and you're discounting the role of faith, right? So this is not a scientific topic. And the play in the end was a very complex, it, it didn't have a simple outcome. So this was theater science. And as I said, we went through this for many, many years um, on topics which was suggested mainly by the theater artists and not by us. We just made sure the science was correct, okay? Um, so um, I, I, this is where the artists and the scientists are you know, in balance. It's, it's very much a, a collaboration. Um, on the, the third area, which is design. So can you have speculative design from bio artists? So this, this person, this very interesting guy, his name is Joe Davis. Um, he calls himself a bio artist, but he's, he's you know, more or less a conceptual artist. Um, he's based at MIT slash Harvard. He has a sort of uh, lab bench in the lab of George Church. George Church, one of his tasks, he's trying to make a company that's resurrecting mammoths. So, you know, he's a scientist who's sort of ambitious. And I think it's exactly in a lab like that that a person like Joe Davis would be able to just run free. But for some reason, he actually came to Bangalore because he heard that there was a thriving bio art practice going on over here. And he got in touch with various people and some me and some colleagues at NCBS were one of those. And uh, we did a little mini project where he just wanted to, uh, to, to have a, a provocative demonstration of storage in DNA. Now, DNA storage has been known for a long time. It's not that the technology was new. Um, but he needed a way to convey the possibilities, the excitement of that in a very pithy way uh, that was also scientifically accurate. So in fact, what we ended up doing was encoded using a very simple code, okay, a way to fold paper, so origami. And if you actually executed that code and you actually folded the paper in this way, the origami would contain, you know, this double helical structure of DNA. Um, it was actually done and executed. It's, it's, it's actually a bioarchive uh, manuscript. You can go and read it, okay? So it's, 
it's not a published paper, but it is out there, and you can see the methods. And this DNA was then put inside a bacterium, extracted, sequenced, and shown that there were no errors. As I said, nothing new about this technology, right? But the paper is provocative because it somehow shows that you can be playful about the information that you store in DNA. You don't have to be serious all the time. Uh, and that the technology is like within reach of an, an artist. You don't actually have to be, you know, working at a biology institution. Um, and out of this comes other aspects of design which may well be used in applications uh, in the future for, for all I know. Okay. Now, the, the last part I want to talk about is, is, is the one I find the most important and the most difficult to actually do is the one that's challenging. This is where you, you have an open invitation to an artist, okay, to come to a, let's say, a research campus like NCBS um, and feel free to engage with the scientists, the, the, the students, I mean, the, the, entire, the entire institution in whatever manner they choose and do whatever you want. No product required. There's no goal like public engagement, nothing. Just see what stimulates you as an artist, what questions crop up. And usually what happens here, um, and we've been doing this for years now, um, is it comes out in the form of critique. Uh, the first part of the engagement is uh, a sort of uh, uh, disappointment at scientists not being able to convey why they're doing what they're doing, apart from the sheer technical challenge of it, right? What are the bigger implications? And if we are not able to convey the big picture, they're saying, why is that gap? Why are you passionate about what you're doing if you're not able to say where it's going? Um, but after that, then they fill that gap. They say, well, if I were doing what you're doing, here's what I would do with it. And, and then they you know, make works of art. Okay? So this was actually done. So these are some of the projects that came out of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the genesis of this. So this is Obeid Siddiqui, um, the founder of NCBS, and uh, you know, a person who actually appreciated this at the time when we pitched it to him. Um, Yashas Shetty, who is a conceptual artist working at the Srishti Institute of Art, Design, and Technology. Now it's called Srishti Manipal. And Oron Katz, uh, who is a bioartist, um, uh, based at that time in Australia. So we actually ran a bioart workshop where we brought in artists and taught them how to do DNA cloning. We got all the permissions for this and they learned how to use these techniques. Some of them then went and uh, actually ended up using it because most of them did not. So this actually stimulated uh, Yashas and me to get into a collaboration which went on for many years. Um, and it ended up that it, at Yashas' institute, then they set up this thing called Art Science Bangalore, which was an ongoing um, bioart uh, uh, practice. Okay, so there are students who've been doing this Year upon year, they're part of an international consortium of sort of biohackers. And I can see, you know, so this is the kind of stuff that should make you nervous, right? Using the words like hacking and so on when you're talking about uh, such powerful tools that biology gives us. But this is where you go when you invite an artist with no boundaries and you call them in. This is what you sign up for. Um, so what we did was, in order to be taken legitimately, we said, now how, how do you show this bioart? How do you show that the scientific community accepts this as both science and art? So remember I said we started the iGEM in 2006, 7, 8. Um, so in 2009, 10, 11, instead of sending scientists to iGEM, we sent artists, right? And they made works that had nothing to do with applications. They were just works of art. Um, and these works were eventually, um, many years of work were then showcased um, in a museum um, in Dublin. It, uh, the artist called it uh, Teen Gene Poems. Uh, it was a pun on not just the word teen, because there were three projects, but also the idea that uh, genetic engineering is in its infancy or its youth anyway. And we don't really know where this uh, technology is going to take us in the future. But even today, each of these projects were literally organisms that were genetically modified and they had some artistic uh, purpose. Uh, for example, one of those projects was the smell of rain project. We introduced a gene into a standard E. coli strain that when expressed would synthesize the smell of rain. Okay, in fact, the smell of rain is actually of a bacterial uh, origin, if you did not know that. So this is, um, this is interesting. So this is a collaboration between a scientist and an artist, an institutional collaboration between NCBS and Srishti, uh, which eventually became part of a museum, uh, museum collection. And these are children who go in there and say, my God, look what you've done. And is this the world that we're living in or that we're soon going to be living in, right? So it, the, the power of this is, is tremendous. And I have to say, a scientist cannot do this, okay? I would not even know how to frame the starting point of such a project how to, you know, how to link it to sort of something viscerally, emotionally interesting to, to uh, the viewer, right? And then stimulate the kind of response you want from them, what kind of, however ambiguous such a response uh, may be, okay? Um, yeah, so that, uh, that museum uh, is actually called Science Gallery Dublin. It's um, an initiative of Trinity College Dublin, which is a publicly accessible space where they keep turning over the exhibits every year, and these are actually hands-on 
um, exhibits made by artists, scientists, engineers, designers, and, and so on. And so this is me at Science Gallery Dublin when they were showing our work there, they asked us to go and explain. Um, and what was interesting about this is that this was a place which was not behind a, an institutional wall. It was accessible from the road, you just walk in. Um, so there was no um, barrier, you know, it didn't seem intimidating or imposing. People could walk in, get a cup of coffee and leave if they wanted to, or they could engage, and typically they did with all the stuff that was going on in there. Um, and it, it really is in such a space that these kinds of dialogues can happen. Remember earlier I said you can do it in an institutional setting. Um, but it doesn't happen by chance. It really, you need these spaces to be these hybrid spaces where scientists, members of the public, engineers and artists can all come and work together. Um, so some of this is now detailed in this book called Idea Colliders by Michael John Gorman, who was the um, director of Science Gallery Dublin. Um, and he makes the point that museums, museums used to be, you know, indistinguishable from archives, more or less. They preserved objects, right? But the role of the museum today is totally different. Um, we, we do have archives and museums do have a role in preserving and examining archives and as research institutions. But museums also then become public spaces. And you would be surprised to learn that this is sort of a rather new concept, that museums are public spaces for dialogue and not just places to show uh, one-way information. Um, so happily from that time, um, there's been a long engagement with Science Gallery International, Government of Karnataka, uh, academic partners in Bangalore, IIC, NCBS, and Srishti, philanthropic partners, very successful public-private partnership, and now there is this building, which is the first new museum in Bangalore in some 30 years since the planetarium. It's going to, if you're going to be in Bangalore next month, it's opening its door soon. It's already been active online, and they've had footfall of uh, several tens of thousands of people online, if they are footfalls, but uh, this is going to be a real exhibit. It's open. The theme is carbon. It's going to be running pretty much for the whole year with physical exhibits, designs, uh, mediators in multiple languages, uh, Hindi, Kannada, English, um, and accompanied by online um, activities uh, as well. So I think you know having a space like this in Bangalore is is really good because it's a dedicated space for these kinds of activities. And you can you can you won't expect you don't know what to expect every time you go in there, but you can be certain it will be interesting and and uh, provocative. Okay, so that's um, that's the end. I think I've run out of my time anyway. So um, just the summaries is I called it collisions between art and science. Well, collisions between art and science, what do they do for me? Why do I find them fulfilling? I'm not speaking for the artists, but for me, they force me out of my comfort zone. Often, you don't think about the broader implications of your work. You often think you know the answer to something when you know the, not the first thing about it, right? They force you outside your comfort zone and enable essential, let's say even uncomfortable uh, conversations. And the more of this that happens, the better things are for, for everybody. So uh, if you, I, I've written about this uh, a few years ago. You can read about it and uh, ask the questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mukund. Uh, uh, just a note, I think uh, the one of the other Infosys winners is in fact... Uh, yes, I, I, should, I should have mentioned, I'm sorry. So, so Janvi Falki, who is the director of science, the founding director of Science Gallery Bengaluru, is the uh, Infosys Prize winner in Humanities uh, this year. She's a right. science historian. So um, we have time for questions in between before coffee. And I'm happy to, to continue talking. So I'm... It's an um, open invitation to please visit the science gallery and, uh, you know, that place is supposed to be for you and responsive to the, to the public, okay? So, yeah. so Mukunda, I'm just wondering how, how do you see these sorts of open-ended, like you say, no deliverable, that sort of artists, you know, spending, you know, artist in residence kind of yeah. uh, things. How, how do institutions, you know, set up things like this? Yeah, so, so actually artists in residence often are not this kind, okay? Artists in residence very much an endorsement. It's selected and there are deliverables, often they are visuals, there'll be something that goes on a website and a book and so on. Um, they rarely are these open-ended engagements. Um, so how do I see them working? It has to be usually maybe you start with an artist in residence program that has some boundaries and then when you build up a personal level of trust where you know that they were not going to come and you know completely destroy the place, um, then you can, um, you, you can reduce the constraints on the engagement. But without that person-to-person -person trust, none of this ever, ever happens, right? Now there are, uh, so, so there are organizations around the world that fund artists to do these kinds of things. Um, and so it can be done in bite-sized pieces. You may not find the first person you meet is the right one to stimulate the interaction, but you do it two or three times and then something will click. So there are places that fund it. And interestingly, a lot of that is getting funded uh, for projects in India, uh, not just in science institutions, but, uh, but more broadly in the field and things like that. 
Yes, I think there's a lot of food for thought here because uh, here in mad science, probably uh, we have been engaging with artists in some way over the years, but not quite the way Mukund described it. Um, was there a question back there, or Arjit? So I was wondering if uh, you have some examples of science, art, and agriculture. Science, art, and agriculture. Uh, not offhand, but uh, I, I certainly think they, they must exist. In fact, uh, many of the topics that uh, Daisy talks about in her thesis here, especially in the critical design and speculative end, do look at the near future in terms of agriculture, food production, using the methods that biology results in and so on. So these are conceptual works, they're not real works built from, yeah, but you'll find some of them uh, in, in this reference. Okay, the, it, sorry, I should have put, it's called better. How do you make things better with biology in quotes? Okay, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, let's thank Mukund again. And uh, there's a moment for you.